Let me tell you about the kind of free market we have in this country, just in the agricultural sector where, I, where I'm in. Now, economists tell us that when four firms control 40% of a market, the market loses its competitive nature. Well, this is every agricultural commodity that is sold in the United States. Currently, four firms control 83.5% of the beef packer market, including Tyson, Cargill, Swift and Company. Four firms control 66% of the pork market, including Tyson, Cargill, Swift and Company, Smithfield. Four firms control 58% of the chicken market. The turkeys, flour milling, seed, and on and on and on. Other agricultural markets are all similarly concentrated. So when these think tanks in Washington, like the Cato Institute, uh, or ideologues, or tools of the rich, have their eyes glaze over and they talk about the glory of the free market, you can remind yourself and others that it's never been the goal of any capitalist to create a job or to foster competition. It's their goal to dominate competition, to destroy it, to impose their will on who they do business with. And that is exactly what they're doing to family farmers in the state for the past 70 years. There's basically no competition in agricultural commodity markets. And farmers may as well be really unorganized workers without a union. And consumers continue to receive more and more processed junk food, tasteless tomatoes, and salmonella flavored eggs. <laughs> These anti-competitive effects of market concentration are further compounded by the fact that I said Tyson, 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 Cargill, Conagra, Cargill, Conagra. You hear these all the time. They dominate every many markets, many markets, and they, they use it to further manipulate prices, to maintain profits, while farm gate prices are, are often at historic lows. This showed up glaring in a glaringly obvious way in 2009. 2009 Family dairy farmers received some of the worst prices they have ever received in the history of the commodity market. $9 for 100 pounds of milk, incredibly low. At the same time, Dean Foods, which controls 40% of the milk, fluid milk market and 70% on the East Coast, posts record profits. There is no free market in agriculture. There are highly leveraged, highly concentrated corporations who have incredible influence in the state capital, incredible influence in Washington, and because of it, we hemorrhaged 500 family dairy farms in one year because of this unjust and undemocratic system. Now, perhaps the most dangerous form of concentration and access is with the corporation Monsanto. Monsanto controls 80% of the corn that is sold in this country, 90% of the soybean, and they can jack up a bag of uh, corn by $30 in one year because of the domination they have. They can impose genetically engineered seed uh, in a market like, and no one raises the question, well, it's banned in Canada, banned in Europe, and people are very concerned about its effects, but it's not tested. They have a revolving door in Washington. Listen to this, Clarence Thomas. Former Monsanto lawyer, he wrote the majority opinion for several key Monsanto cases. Michael Taylor, who once worked for the FDA, then went to work for Monsanto as their chief counsel, went back to work for the FDA to approve RBGH, recombinant bovine growth hormone. Uh, Roger Beachy, former director of the Monsanto-funded Danforth Plant Science Center, now the director of the USDA National Institute on Food and Agriculture. Islam Siddiqui, Vice President of Monsanto and DuPont Pesticide Lobbying Group, Crop Life. <laughs> I love those euphemistic names they have for those things. Is now Agriculture Negotiator and U.S. Trade Representative, and on and on and on. Elena Kagan, now on the Supreme Court, pushed through GM alfalfa, and on and on and on. Now this market dominance when these agribusiness corporations become so powerful and sell us things at retail while buying from us at wholesale, it furthers concentration in these markets. And it further con furthers concentration at the level of production. And basically it's called factory farming. 
leveraged by agribusiness, not represented by agribusiness dominated government. Family farmers are told to get big or get out. Now some family farmers see, some farmers see no alternative and they place their bets in the false promise of economies of scale and more subsidies. Others are just cowboys and they want to have 8,000 cows in one place. Yeehaw! Right? Those are the two types of factory farms, but factory farming is pushing family-scale agriculture out in this state. This ecologically destructive and anti-democratic model of agriculture has some major cheerleaders in this state as well. The Dairy Business Association, the Professional Dairy Producers Association, and the Farm Bureau. Michael Feldman calls them the access of ag. <laughs> Leaders of these organizations smile at you and shake, their ha shake your hand, claiming the legacy of the family farm, while at the same time promoting policies that drive it into extinction. And they call it progress. Well, as a student of history and someone who studied Bob LaFollette, this is not progress. Monopolistic control of agricultural markets is not progress. Dominating agricultural landscapes, destroying family scale agriculture is not progress. Paralyzing and destroying the environment with gigantic manure lagoons is not progress. But there is an emerging democratic alternative that we can all take part in. The local and sustainable agricultural movements are gaining force in this country and this state. And it is so simple to fight back. You fight back every time you eat. Buy a tomato from a local farmer. Go to a farmer's market. Subscribe to a CSA. Support urban agriculture. Get on your local and form a local food policy council. Support farm to school programs, farm to hospital programs. They're happening. We can support it every single time we eat. Millions more are doing it. And because of it, for the, last, for the first time last year, we have had an increase in young farmers on the land inspired by what they see as an environmentally sustainable movement for self-determination and food sovereignty. We are putting young farmers on the land. Let's march this progress forward. Yeah. Incentivizing family scale sustainable farms who care about local control, who care about local purchasing and are integral to their local communities. This is progress that I'm talking about. Incentivizing farmers to embrace their environmentalism through grazing programs and organic transitions and family scale agriculture to work in harmony with na nature and help cool the planet. This is the progress that I'm talking about. Lots of people on the land, broad opportunities, broad wealth. This is the progress I'm talking about. Food sovereignty, a farmer-controlled, consumer-oriented food system where the right to healthy, nutritious, and culturally appropriate food is the progress I am talking about. That is what it means to be a progressive. That is what it means to be a progressive. But it seems like some Democrats are scared of this word, progressive. And some of their advisors tell them that it might be risky. My sister ran for assembly, and some of the advisors are saying, don't put progressive on there. Don't talk about factory farms. You're going to scare people away. Well, if we have no control over our language, we have no means to articulate ideas that motivate our fellow citizens to achieve a more sustainable, just, and democratic country. And we have got to take our language back because it seems like the right wing in this country, they can say whatever they want. How many times have you heard Republicans idolize Ayn Rand in public? Oh, I've, got, I've got Ron Johnson in my speed dial under Ayn Rand, actually. So. And Paul Ryan, he, it's mandatory for his staff to read Atlas Shrugged. Do you know that? This is crazy. Could, could his opponent make all his interns read Capital or The Jungle by Upton St. Clair? I mean, we have that. 
This is the skewed Citizens United debate we're having in this country. And it allows crazed Tea Partiers to march into Washington, slash $38 billion for programs mostly for the poor and middle class, and the president can barely raise a timid finger. Otherwise, he's a socialist. Oh no, this is the dirtiest word. He's a socialist. Well, what are we going to say? What are we going to say when they call us a socialist? My uh, senator, Pam Galloway from Wausau, when asked about what she thought about the hundreds of thousands of people in Madison, she said, the socialists are using it to recruit. <laughs> oh no! My first reaction to Pam was, oh no, Pam, I'm so scared. I'm so scared, Pam. What should I do? Are they going to eat my dogs or, or just my babies? What are the socialists going to do, Pam? Should I hide under my bed or should I build a bunker? What am I going to do? But I mean, not to be sarcastic, but Pam... When they call us a socialist, we're doing something right. Pat Kreitlow, I want to ask you a question too, because when Sean Duffy was elected, the night he was elected, he said, it's my duty to crush this cradle-to-grave socialism. That's what he said on his election night. That's my generation's bill, he said. What are you going to say, Pat Kreitlow, when Sean Duffy wields this axe? Take it head on. Pat, I want you to say, you know what? Call it green, call it red, call it socialist, call it liberal, but these are my values. Fairness, equity, loving thy neighbor as thyself, helping us each other out. Supporting your neighbor, supporting your fellow worker. These are my values. These are the values that are going to take the state of Wisconsin forward. These are the values of a progressive. Solidarity, everybody. stumbled. That wouldn't have been so good. Where's that Tony? I am so relieved because they had said I had to fire up the crowd. <laughs> oh man, someone says, you've got to follow that. I said, yes. <laughs> because you see, I'm not prepared. <laughs> I was thinking rapture. Why write a speech and make notes when you're going to be gone anyway? <laughs> and you all wouldn't be able to find me. It'll be sitting here trying to get into my pants. Well, because they get left behind. I mean. <laughs> that didn't come off quite right, did it? <laughs> All right, you know, rapture, you can't take anything with you, even your pants. So, at any rate, oh boy. So where's Tony? <laughs> well, let's bring him back. You know, uh, well, first of all, thanks, Tony. And on a serious side of this, I'll tell you why it really does lift my spirits, because I'm to the point now where uh, I'm not kind of looking forward at doing more things. And it is such a relief to me to look around, both in the position that I have now, I travel the state quite a bit on uh, working for the administration in the area of rural development, and there are so many younger people 
who have good values. You never hear about them, but they're out there doing things just the way Tony and his family are doing them. They're starting small businesses and they're teaching or they're working in nonprofits. They're engaged in their community, and that's really where the change is going to happen. And any, if there's anything that we can do that really is important, in my opinion, is to reinforce in young people the importance of their engagement and their involvement in their government. You know, this, this whole democracy thing, you know, that one of the buzzwords that's been going around for quite a while, I've never liked it, I don't know why, is this whole thing about end game. You've heard this term, well, what's your end game, you know? I don't know. I mean, I just got this far, and you know. Well, in democracy, what I want to share with you today, and why it's important that you hear, and why this is just the beginning of your task, is that there isn't an end game. Because if you let's take that apart, if there's an end game, then there's a beginning game. So this is the way my mind works. I break it down, and I say, well, what's the beginning game? Well, the beginning game is leadership. In other words. A lot of people concentrate on things like raising their families or trying to have a job or doing their business or running their farm. So they don't have a lot of time to maybe get engaged in the political process and start analyzing policy and giving speeches and bringing crowds to their feet and doing those, these sorts of things. These become leaders. And we've had good leaders over time. Someone mentioned earlier, uh, Gaylord Nelson, you know, uh, an individual who, when he was senator, really influenced my interest in looking at the environment and engaging public life and possibly seeking an opportunity to run for office. He inspired me to do that. Or Dave Obey, who I first went to work for as a volunteer student at Northland College in 19, whatever it was, 68 or 69, you know, to help him get elected, get elected to Congress. And Dave fought all those years, whether it was in the Wisconsin legislature or in Congress, on behalf of, well, working people and social justice and doing the right thing. Ed Garvey, with the kinds of work that he, he has done. You know, you can go right down the list. Feingold, you know, standing by the issues that matter to people. Understanding early on that it was money that was corrupting the political process and even though he was working against the tides and the currents, fought to pass legislation to restrict that flow of money into campaigns. I mean, there have been good leaders out there doing the things that need to be done. In this area, in the Eau Claire area, I saw Jeff a little earlier, and some of the others, that's leadership. But the end game, if you want to talk about end game, is action. It's not enough just to inspire and to do your part as a leader. In a democracy, if you don't have people willing to take action on some level, in their own way, to reinforce what the leaders are asking them to do or the way that it's being pointed, it will all fail. And we'll have to start all over again. And in many ways, that's where we are today. You know, as you this whole thing about the rapture. How about we just forget the rapture today? As you can see, I'm a little nervous about it. I, I could get called, but, but then what if David Prosser gets called too? Can you turn it down? That's what I want to know. <laughs> now I lost my train of thought. Oh, anyway. So, you know, we've got to really think of ways that we can take the energy that we come off of these sorts of events with. And the things that Tony is really saying, what is he saying to us? He's saying that he's willing to step out. He's willing to take a risk. He's willing to encourage and inspire and lead by example in his family. He's willing to show the way for those who think that, in his case, big agriculture is the only answer. He's willing to put himself on the line. So what it means is that each of us have a responsibility in some way or other to put ourselves on the line. And this whole thing about the recalls and the unhappiness about what has happened, you know, it's, it's important that uh, we pay attention. And I hope that you will get engaged in some way in these recalls, not out of spite, 
but to redirect the action of our government. That's what these recalls are all about. Go, go, go away from this idea of personalizing it and go back to what you believe in. It's sort of what President Obama said when he said not too long ago, this is not who we are. Those were powerful words to me. In spite of the fact that we had been harmed as a nation by the actions of these terrorists, Barack Obama understands that it's also important to send a message to the world about what we are and what we value. You know, it, And we can each do that. I promise myself, because a lot of times I fall back on something that my dad said or my mother said when I was growing up on the farm. I was going to try to kind of stay away from those sorts of stories today and kind of talk a little bit more about politics. But I can't help think of what, how often my dad would say to me, think about this and just do the right thing. You know, and we were just common, ordinary people on a small farm in northeast Wisconsin. My dad had no aspirations besides being a good father, raising his family, leading by example in terms of the work that he did. He was a professional uh, metal fabricator and a welder. He also brought that little farm from being a sand farm to a very productive small unit. He took pride in what he was able to do. I asked him one time why he didn't try to make more money by using the farm a little differently. And he said to me, I'll tell you something. You might not, you, you'll learn this a little later in life if you pay attention, he added. You'll learn this a little later in life. Money isn't everything. And it's not even the most important thing. And, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, well, you don't need a car. I do, you know, and all the things that <laughs> kids think about. But, in fact, uh, it is true. Because what we have in this nation today is not Democrats versus Republican. What we really have is a sort of class warfare. And that's what people that's what people that's what people on the high end of this class warfare don't want to talk about. Because if we can keep it in political terms, then we can keep it in the political re arena. But the fact of the matter is most of the wealth in this country is controlled by a very small number of people. And more of the wealth is shifting in that direction. And if you go home today believing there's nothing that you can do about it, because the wealth that is out there, that's not yours, will be used against you, then that side has won. So we can't have that attitude. We have to have the attitude that my dad tried to inspire us to have when we were taking on tough jobs on the farm, and they were tough jobs for kids, my brother, my sisters, and otherwise, and that is that you can do this. Figure out a way to do it. You don't have to be able to come before a crowd like this and motivate them and get them to their feet. You don't have to have a lot of money. You don't have to be recognized in the community as some sort of big leader. All you have to do is to begin to lead by example, to begin to sort out the things that really matter, to engage your friends and neighbors in the conversations about how you want your community to look, what you think your values ought to be, and to try to inspire those around you, family, friends, and otherwise, to adopt those same sorts of values. Because that's who we are as a nation. And that's what democracy is all about. It's not an end game. It's not that we missed it, we should have been there in 1949, the year I was born, or we were there two years ago and now it's lost. It's an ongoing process of engagement, understanding, involvement, and participation. And that's what we all need to understand and take to those around us and share that message. Because that's where the real power and the real investment uh, will take us to a better democracy and more engagement. You know, I think about... It, 
Ed, I'm, John, I'm just not used to this applause. Do you have an applause sign somewhere? Of course, I grew up in a more conservative part of the state. Appla applause was, it was more like getting chased out of town where I come from, but... You know, I think about, think about this a little bit. I, I did on the way over. And I hope Ed won't be offended. But oftentimes I talk about Ed because he's a good friend of mine. And occasionally people will say to me, and I, this is so untrue, they'll say, well, I like Ed basically, but he's too confrontational. You know? <laughs> Imagine that. You know? Or over the years, you know, I've worked in both state and uh, national government, and people say to me, well, yeah, you know that Dave Obey, and I understand Dave was here this morning, and he is just a hero of mine. There's just no other way to talk about it. But they'll say, well, yeah, you know, that, that OB, he's, he's smart and he does a lot of good things, but geez, he's short-tempered. <laughs> oh, what a shame, you know. You know, even, even in the case of, you know, people like Herb Cole, you know, they say, well, you know, we, 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 wish, we wish Herb was a little bit more passionate about the things that he believes in. Well, and on the other hand, other hand you know what they tell me? I run for Congress a couple times. I'm engaged in working with... Well, people who are trying to create jobs and build communities, they say, well, you know, Stan, you're a little too passionate. I'm too passionate. Herb's not passionate enough. You know, and it just goes, kind of goes down like that. These different, Mike McCabe, I saw him earlier. Well, you know, Mike's a purist about these things. Oh, what a shame. We have people that understand the issue. They feel strongly about it. They're willing to kind of stake out a territory and show us the way. Can't have that in this society, can we? No, that makes no sense. You know, or Russ Feingold, whom I mentioned earlier. Or Barack Obama, who they say, you know, he's just, he just tries to find the middle ground all too often. I'll take the middle ground, all right? If the right wing is where we're headed, I'll take it. But in, after all is said and done, and all of that is out there, the fact of the matter is what makes their effort worthwhile is your ability to take action, to sort through it and decide what each and every one of you can do to build a better life in the communities that you live, in the schools where you teach, you know, in the families that you're raising, in the churches that you belong to, or in the many community organizations that you work with. That's what democracy is all about. That's what America is all about. That's why Wisconsin has been a leader, because that has been, that's rooted in our value system, our progressive value system. So let's think about the things that are said today. Let's be inspired by the actions and the words of the people that have come before you, the people, likes of Dave Obey and Tony and, and all the others. But more importantly, let's figure out that small thing that you can do between now and the next time this Fighting Bob Fest comes to northern Wisconsin that will make a difference. That neighbor that you can talk to, that health care professional that you can help understand what people are struggling with. Those people who don't feel they have the time to really be engaged citizens. Make them engaged citizens. You see this finger? Well, I mean, on my hand. For those of you in the back, there's a bandage on this finger. I'm on the positive end of a chainsaw accident. All right. I was hurrying to make some make maple syrup and, uh, well, to make a long story short, if anyone who's cut wood with a chainsaw knows I'm a very lucky guy, finger is still here, but I nicked it. I nicked it with the chainsaw, kicked back. Fortunately, I had gloves on. This happened on, yes, April Fool's Day. Uh, and anyway, so it's getting better now, and it's bending, it's doing all the things that it should be doing. But it was a sad day for me because I was in uh, for care, and I heard a young child crying. Uh, I was in one, you know, one of those little cubicles that they have in, you know, where you can't see who else is there. And 
I was trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. And then the little girl was taken to another room, and I wasn't sure what, what the issue was. Was it an accident? Whatever. And then finally I heard medical professionals talking about it. And they were saying, well, she's got asthma. She's really got a bad case of asthma. Well, where's her mother? Well, her mother's not here. Her mother's working. Who brought her in? Well, I think it's her grandmother. I'm not sure. Well, and you, then you know what the question was after that? Well, does she have insurance? Well, I don't think she does. The mother didn't send a car. The grandmother doesn't have a card. Well, did, did, can you call the mother? Well, the mother's at work, but the grandmother said she doesn't have a card. She doesn't have insurance. And so there was this whole discussion, you know, around me about whether this child would be able to get the health care that she needed because of the issue of whether or not she could afford to have it. And it made me think of the instances. Ed talked about his daughter. I think about my son who was disabled in a swimming accident, who relies on Social Security. And I think of all the kids who in this country and in this state who re rely on medical assistance. And then I have to put up with the likes of people in Congress, at least some of them, talking about how we can phase out that system because it's not necessary. We'll give people vouchers to buy their health insurance and to get coverage. Or you talk about the fact that the whole health care initiative introduced by then supported and signed by the president is somehow wrong and unnecessary when even today the question is can you afford to get that sort of coverage. We have a lot of work before us, whether it's maintaining and building this effort to reform the health care system or ensuring that we have good agriculture, the kind that Tony is promoting, where we have local foods and local growers, and we do more locally with energy because it creates jobs here at home and it does the right thing. Or we do what we keep preaching and talking about, which is making sure our kids have good schools, good education, and compete in the world. You know, all of those are the issues that, are, that should matter to us. And those are the things we should be fighting for. And when you leave here today, if you don't make a commitment to work on those issues and ensure we elect the sort of people who can make this country who we are, I'm not coming back here again. <laughs> I might not be back here after six anyway. Thank you all very much.